Thank you, Cody. Um, just briefly, I want to uh, be clear. I, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist or a therapist. I'm a finance guy. <laughs> Who happened to go through all these experiences and after 40 years of just, you know, tragedy, uh, certain events caused me to go, enough. And uh, I began that healing process. And here today is Dr. Rosanna Skears. She is the top psychologist in Houston for abuse victims. She's also a director of Resilient People. So Rosanna, thank you. So um, I do have notes, so you'll see me moving back first. But today I'm gonna talk about the power of the mind to heal from trauma. A little feedback. Uh, horrible things can happen to any of us. Uh, the, depending on the severity of the experience, it can damage our lives significantly, it can even kill us. And tragic events come in our lives in many ways. Uh, sexual abuse being one, uh, rape, uh, horrible events like tragedies, like hurricanes, uh, natural disasters, uh, death of a child, the death of a parent to a child. All of these things have impact on us. But here's the key point, is how we perceive these events and the decisions we make about them dramatically affect our life. If we perceive these as negative and they're left unresolved, traumatic events can and do leave psychological symptoms. Some can be quite severe. And they'll last long after the physical injuries heal. The unhealed psychological issues within our mind can damage our lives in many, many ways. Uh, I don't know if you experienced trauma. Uh, or if you did any decisions you made about it, but I will make you a promise. No matter, what ha no matter what happened, no matter how horrible you may have perceived it, you can heal. You can live a joyful and fully productive life. Uh, and I know that's possible because I did it. And it took me over 40 years. The reason I speak is I don't want other people to have to wait that long. Uh, the, the road to a joyful life is quite good. Um, I want to begin this by making a, a, a very important distinction between the brain and the mind. I believe the brain is an information collection, storage, and retrieval mechanism. Now it also does some really great and wonderful things, keeps us breathing, keeps our heart beating, because we don't have to think about that. But the mind, uh, the, excuse me, the brain does not think. The mind thinks, and the mind creates. And the mind is subjective. It will create what you think. If you think a thought long enough, positive or negative, it will get into your conscious mind and run your life. Now think about that. If you think a thought long enough, it will impact your life, whether positive or negative. You want to really fast forward it, add passion and emotion to that thought. So I started with this in, in, uh, in 1945, I was born, at six months old, my mother had a very serious emotional mental breakdown. And she tried to kill me and a brother. Uh, I have two other brothers, they have no recollection. And uh, she was sent away and we were sent away. Now, I never knew anything about that. It was like the family secret. I only found out was, uh, it, it, I was 20 some odd years old, visit a, a relative and uh, the grandmother was saying, oh, you remember when you lived here? I said, I lived here? She says, yeah, you lived here for about four or five months. Your mother had this breakdown and all you kids were sent away with relatives. I had no idea, absolutely not. What's interesting though, is subconsciously I had these horrible night terror dreams, which 
stayed with me uh, from time I was, could remember until I was about 22 and got into therapy. The second experience that happened was 1958. I was 13 years old. We lived on Long Island, New York. My parents had a little cabin, Catskill Mountains. They bought it when it was an old one-room schoolhouse with two outhouses. And it never got really big, but it had no phone, no TV, no radio, and certainly in 1958 there was no internet. And it was a fabulous place. It was a great river. We'd go fish and hiking, build tree houses, uh, swim. Just it, it was wonderful. And uh, there, there was a family had a friend, a gentleman named Bob, was also the local policeman. And Bob came around a lot, and he'd he'd take me fishing sometimes or hiking and. Uh, he, he bought me my first rifle, a Mossberg 22. Taught me how to shoot it, how to care for it, clean it. Uh, I don't have any more guns, but, uh, but anyway, he just, and he took me riding in his police car. You imagine that's like for a 13 year old, lights, sirens, pulling people over. It was just incredible. It was incredible. until one day, I'm good. he took me to his house and sexually abused me. I'm 13 years old. I knew nothing about sex. I mean, I'd never even seen a Playboy magazine. I, had, I was never taught about sex. I had German immigrant parents. This is just something that wasn't talked about. I knew something wrong happened. And it felt terrible. But here's what he did. He told me how much he loved me. And how special, so very special this was between us that I could never, ever tell anyone. For 20 years, I never did. I mean, he was a policeman. He was friends with my parents. I had no idea what to do. So I just bottled it up and stuffed it down. But here's the worst thing that happened, is the decision I made after that experience. Again, he's a cop, friend of the family. And I had a very religious upbringing by my mother. Well, I believed I committed this grave and unforgivable sin. And I told myself that over and over again. I wound up blaming myself for the sexual abuse that was perpetrated on me. So here I'm 13 years old. My belief system is ruptured. It was a complete falling apart of what I believed. I was, I was 13, I was safe in my little world. It was beautiful. I never, ever believed someone would hurt me, especially someone I began to really care about and love and a friend of the family and a policeman. So this was the foundation and beginning of shame in my life. And if you know, shame requires secrecy, silence, and judgment. Well, I was sworn to secrecy, so I kept silent and I judged myself. So I had and I lived all three. Based upon my decision that I was guilty and did commit this grave and unfor unforgivable sin, I built a story that ran my life for 40 years. And my story included, uh, excuse me, included the message that I'm not worthy, that I do not count that I had to struggle. And my God, struggle I did. I had four automobile accidents, three motorcycle accidents, failed relationships as a young man, um, business failures, debilitating pain. Finally, after a while, I got into a five-year legal nightmare that included being investigated by the SEC and being a target of a criminal investigation by the FBI. So that was like, uh, 
it was kind of it in my mind. I kind of went, I don't think I can go on with this. And to me, I had a choice. I had two choices. Either I was going to live or I was going to die. And quite frankly, dying was pretty high on the list. But I had a great wife, kids, and I met Rosanna. <laughs> and she had the ability to work with me and draw out that negativity. And it, 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 it saved me in a number of ways. Because one of the things she said, Rick, you're convicting yourself. The FBI has, doesn't have to do it for you. She was right. Because I always felt I was in the wrong no matter what. So I began that healing journey. And when I made that choice, looking back, I really have a strong, strong sense the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, guided me along the way. I learned that the mind defaults to what we have convinced ourselves is true about who we are. If we create a negative story about who we are, we will live that. Excuse me, I got a little bit of a brain mouse. Uh, if we create a negative story, we're going to live that story. And as events happen, we just unconsciously, subconsciously fill in the blanks to fit the events. I'm not worthy. I'm bad. I need to be punished. I make bad decisions. I never really succeed. I'm not smart enough, tall enough, handsome enough. Fill in the blanks. It followed me all over. I know this, without mindful intervention, the false premise we construct in our lives will be dragged from negative event to a negative event until we choose to do something different. Emma Curtis Hopkins, a well-published author, quotes, the world will persist in showing up for you as you perceive the world to be. If you think, as I did, hard, horrible, and bad thoughts, you will attract it, and you will have more and more bad and horrible experiences. Now, I'm condensing 40 years here, so, but uh, then events happen, and all the beliefs and the power of my mind came together for me in what I call my aha moment, a profound realization. I had, uh, I've done a number of business deals and I've made substantial amounts of money and, and, and effectively lost it all. And I had taken a company public, grew it, it was doing really well, um, and we had some seller notes we had to pay off, and when it came time to do that, I, I went to the board, there were five equal partners, and I said, guys, we got to pay off this debt or this guy will foreclose. And they said, no, he won't, no, he won't. I said, yes, he will. He's already told us that. They wouldn't vote for it. The seller called the note, and we lost the business. Instead of making substantial amounts of money, we made a, a very small amount, de minimis amount. That threw me into a huge depression. I was in Houston. I went back to Colorado and just laying around, feeling very sorry for myself. And I did something that threw my back out. Now, I've, I've had that experience throughout my life of debilitating back pain. So I'm lying around, and Annie says, all right, look, you, you need to get to a doctor, which I did. And they sent me to the spine clinic in Colorado. And uh, they did their MRIs and everything. And I, and I was a notable patient because I was in so much pain, they knew when I came in the door because I was screaming my head off. So they said, all right, Rick, you've got some serious herniated discs, and we're going to do the surgery, and we'll fix you up. I said, okay. So I'm back home, and somebody comes over and brings me a book. And the book's titled The Mind-Body Prescription by a Dr. John Sarno of the New York University Medical Center. And he specialized in pain, pain management, and did surgery. Now, he posited the theory that pain is the result of subconscious rage. He also said, you don't have to understand what the rage is about to heal the pain. 
you have to understand how the mind works and the mind will do anything to keep you from bringing up those painful memories. I read the book, I was mildly interested, and I, I, you know, I just read it, and I, you know, kind of, so. One night I'm laying on the couch, feeling really sorry for myself, and absolutely miserable, and a little, lot of pain. And my wife, Annie, is a classically trained singer. And I always loved hearing her sing, it's just, it's just beautiful. She sung at Carnegie Hall and all over, and, and so I'm laying there feeling, wow, this is wonderful. And I realize I have no pain, absolutely no pain. And when I realized I had no pain, that pain came flooding back in. <laughs> and I'm going, something happened in my subconscious mind. And for one of the few times in my life, I didn't blow it off. I thought about it. I found that book. I reread that book every day for five days. I did every exercise, every process. And slowly, the pain diminished. Went back to the spine clinic, and the guy said, we didn't hear you coming in. <laughs> and he said, you got movement. You're moving. And he checked me out and all. He says, look, we're going to put off this surgery. Uh, I, I, I don't want to do it right now. So he's come back in two weeks. Two, two weeks I came back. I'm doing great. He says, go golfing, hiking, do whatever you do. You blow it up, I'll fix it. So an interesting note here. I, I had spoken to Dr. Sarno's clinic a number of times. And he said, here's the interesting thing. Some people read that book and get healed. They never come to the clinic. We've had people come to the clinic, and no matter what we do, they do not get healed. And we had other people come into the clinic, and they do the work, and they get healed. So he said, here was the key we discovered. If a person doesn't believe that the mind can heal them, they never get healed. If they do believe the possibility, their chances of getting healed are very high. So here's the things I started to do to move my healing process forward. And I want to note that everything I did further convinced me of the power of the mind to heal. So I was sitting around thinking about this, and I realized my mind was full of real negativity. I said, okay, I gotta start dealing with it. So I, I wrote up a big sign, hung it on my office door, and said, what, what am I thinking? The first night, I came back, I kept the journal and all, and I was stunned at the amount of negative thoughts that went through my mind, not just every day, but every hour and every minute. Now, I didn't like feeling things, because the feelings were uncomfortable. Some were painful. So I put them down with alcohol, drugs, uh, work, anger. Every one of my actions, either drugs or alcohol, was involved. So I realized I had to allow these repressed feelings to come out of my subconscious mind into my conscious mind and feel them, to fully experience them no matter how painful or uncomfortable they were. And a lot of them were really painful and uncomfortable. But as I did this, I'd like to tell you, those feelings diminished immediately. They didn't. But as I did it, they became less and less and less controlling of my mind. And I became happier and happier and happier. And I began to believe, fully believe, I could heal. Stop sabotaging my life and possibly even live a joyful and productive life full of love. Dr. Carolyn Leaf quotes, as we think, think, we change the physical nature of our mind. 
as we consciously direct our thinking, we can wire out negative patterns of thinking and replace them with healthy thoughts. Again, the power of the mind. So you can heal, you can extricate the negative beliefs buried in your subconscious mind and replace them with healthy, loving beliefs. You can rise above the false story you created. Now, here's the thing. As you're doing this, you're gonna move from an old negative story to a new positive one. It takes diligent work. Proverbs 23, seven said, as someone thinks within himself, so he is. And I realized this was all within me. I can tell you for 30 years, I went all over the country going to healing seminars, spiritual seminars, this seminar, that seminar. But I always looking to get for someone to heal me and not do the work necessary to heal myself. Here are the keys I use to begin to live a joyful and productive life. Now, Cody's going to come up here and set up this computer for me because I have no idea how to do that. And then it'll continue. But if you do some Google research on the power of the mind, you'll be amazed at the amount of substantive evidence out there. Now, it's not taught much. It's not talked about much. But I assure you this, the mind is so powerful, it can create whatever you want it to create, positive or negative. It can also uncreate and create anew. And there are some other quotes I'll share with you in a little bit. Aha. And Cody, what do I do with this? <laughs> OK. So this is my quote, and I think I already told you. You can, you can heal, you can extricate the negative beliefs, oh, I got it right here, excuse me, buried in your subconscious mind, and replace them with healthy, loving beliefs. You can rise above the false story you created. So as we think, we change the nature of our mind. And in, in Proverbs, I think I've already said this. So here are the keys. Decide you want to heal. Stay committed and diligent. This is a, jo a journey to a joyful life to heal. It is a journey and it requires diligence. And it's really easy to fall off. I told you I used to, as Cody said, I, was, uh, I abused alcohol severely in my life. <laughs> And one of the incredibly stupid things I did, I'd quit drinking. I felt so darn good, I had a drink. You know, and it, it's crazy what the mind can do. Do the work. You have to find a mechanism to get those uncomfortable thoughts out of your subconscious mind into your conscious mind. Meditate was really good for me. This gave me some guidance on what I needed to heal because things would come up in my mind. Be aware of your thoughts. Keep a journal of what you're thinking. This will be a guide to you of things you need to deal with. And when you have a negative thought, don't stuff it down, write it down. I have pads and pads and pads and pads of things I wrote. And what I found is when I write things, and actually see them, it's more of an impact on me than just saying them. Brene Brown says, and it's a great quote I like, she said, when you repress bad feelings, we suppress all feelings. We just stop being feeling loving people. So as I was going through this process, uh, being judgmental as I was, I used to get really upset when I had a bad thought. And I go, man, I'm, 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 I'm going the wrong way. And I thought about it and thought about it, and I came up with what I call first thought, second thought. So when I have that bad thought, I feel it, I experience it, I bless it, and I release it, and I immediately come up with a second thought. 
So I don't blame my first for the first negative thought, but I do hold myself accountable if I, can, if I continue down that path. So write, take the time to write your history, the story you want in your mind. And as you do that, and this will be a process, you won't get the story the way you want right away, but write that story. Read it every morning upon wakening and evening, every evening before going to sleep. This will be the basis of creating the life and the story of the truth and beauty of who you really are. When you're feeling down, smile. Smile is a powerful thing, and I didn't know this. I, uh, I wasn't much of a smiley person, and, and I didn't smile a lot. And I started thinking about this. And I used to wake up grumpy in the morning, too, because, oh, God, another day. What, you know, what's going on? And, and so I, two things came to my mind from my early religious training, which wasn't very loving, but it, 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 a lot of it stuck in my mind. So I remember this quote, this is the day the Lord had made. Rejoice and be happy in it. Or that, That's not an exact quote, but it's close. So I started saying that when I got up in the morning. And I, I got up feeling a little better. Then I go in the bathroom. My wife thought this was hilarious. I decided to look in the mirror and look in my eyes. And I realized I never really looked in my eyes. I never really looked in anybody's eyes. I think that's because of all the shame I have. So I looked in that mirror and said, good morning, Rick. God loves you and I love you. And I broke into this huge smile and my wife said, what? And she said, all right, it works, keep doing it. But I kept finding things that moved me to the positive and out of the negative. If you're feeling bad, move. The body responds to movement. We can get locked in to negativity. And I used to do that. I'd get locked in and I'd sit and I'd worry about how bad things were. But if you get smooth, uh, you know, uh, stretch, move. It's going to refocus your outlook on life. And then there's a thing called NLP. I don't know if anybody heard it. It's an acronym for Neuro Linguistic Programming. And that posits the theory that we operate from three stages of consciousness. Kinesthetic, uh, when our eyes are looking down and we're in feeling. And a predicate there is I feel. Next one is auditory, where your eyes are up and moving like this, and you're talking to yourself. And a predicate there is I say. And the third one is visionary, where your eyes are looking up and you can see possibilities you can create. And a predicate there is I see. So I developed a process that whenever I got feeling down and all, I just lift my arm up and look up and go, oh, okay, wait a minute, I see some good things here. And it really helped change my outlook. And I was diligent on this. I, was dilig I became diligent on everything because I did not want to live the life I had been living. And why my wife put up with me, phew, God only knows, but she did. And I tell you what, we have an incredible relationship. We have four kids, six grandkids, and we're all very close. And she was just a gift in that. Here's what Buddha said. All that we are is a result of what we have thought. The mind is everything. What we think we, we, what we, think we become. A life is the creation of our mind. So all of this gets back to the power of the mind and our thinking. And you can think your way out of anything and unfortunately into everything. But it's the beauty of the thing. So learn to use the power of your mind to create the life you deserve. And you deserve a joyful, loving life. Remember, there's a parable of the sower, and I, I, this is, you know, I'll get this partially right, but there's this farmer going to plant his seeds, and he drops some along the path, and crows pick them up and eat them. Then he drops some along the side of the road, and they, they sprout, and the thimbles choke them out. Then he drops some, they begin in the field, and thin soil, and it's enough. They get some water, and they sprout, but they wither and die. And then he plants thing in fertile soil that's tended and prepared for the, the plant and the seeding. And that's where 
I had to go with my mind. I had to prepare my mind and know this was possible for me. And I can tell you, it is possible. So let go of the old story. Embrace the story of who you truly are. Beautiful, loving, lovable. Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That's why you cannot keep that old and have the new. You have to make the transition. So for all you've gone through, forgive yourself. Love yourself above all else. For when you completely love yourself, you then have the capacity to love others. So the last quote is this. Napoleon Hill did this, and I always loved it, but not for what many people think. Think and grow rich. Grow rich in the wonder and beauty of life. Go rich in how blessed you are. Grow rich in the wonder and beauty you can create. It's a beautiful thing, and your mind is powerful. And the power of the mind will heal and will heal your trauma. Thank you. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be open now for conversation. So what I'd like is for any questions you have to ask, we're also going to turn off the recording and the, the video. So you don't have to worry about anything you say being recorded. You certainly don't have to use your name. So I will answer any question to the best of my ability you ask. So, and you can also check out Resilient People. Um, the website has a lot of information. There's a book uh, called Resilient People, A Journey from Childhood Abuse to Healing to Love. Dr. Scarce will, she's going to do this, do this for me. She, she will be upstairs, and if you like to purchase a book, you can do that. You can all, also buy it from Amazon. It did become an Amazon bestseller in its category, and it was written up in Inc. Magazine as one of the top six books for leaders to read to better understand abuse and healing. So with that said, I thank you for your listening, and please, any questions? Thank you.